This is the Voice of the Land podcast with your hosts, Kevin Arnold and Nick Paulus. I'm one of your hosts, Kevin Arnold, and alongside me behind that proverbial glass, our producer extraordinaire, Peter Tullup. Peter, how's it going tonight? I'd be going better if I didn't make that little mistake at the beginning, but I know what I did wrong, so we're good. But I was trying to save you. I, you just say technical difficulties. That's technical all it is. You know, you don't. Nobody has to take any sort of blame. It's just think, think, technology. I think we were looking to relive the uh, CAF championship video again. Was the problem? Oh, that's which, right. You know, which, hey, uh, I mean, I can, I can watch that over and over and over again. With what we've had to watch the last few years of the Cavs, good I point. mean, I'll watch that any day of the week, <laughs> and hopefully. The NBA draft on July 29th is the step in the right direction to get back to moments like that sooner rather than later. Now, usually, of course, I've already introduced my brother, Nick Paulus, but of course, he is on assignment. As we mentioned, he wouldn't be here this week. So always got to give that call to the bullpen or to one of our insiders that we always love to have on the show our buddy Mac Robinson joins the show. Mac, man, thank you so much for coming in tonight, man. Happy to be here, Kevin. Super professional. I love it, man. Love love the look hey. for you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Hey, man, I'm just trying to <laughs> I'm just trying to get where you're at, man. I mean, hey, I'm stuff. trying to get the assignments like Paulus, man. I want to get that kind of assignment. Oh, right. I mean, did you see everything he was posting? <laughs> yes, yes, I did. Yeah, I did. Uh, I like I said, Paulus. Give me the connection. I want to know where you're going and how to get that assignment, please. Yeah, he's <laughs> on assignment is the business way to say it. He's I know. He's taking his vacation he, I know. out I to it. San Diego, kind of showing his wife Kelly around because he lived out there for yeah. a while. So that's why he kind of has an affinity for like Chargers, the San, when they were the San yeah. Diego Chargers, and, and their, he always talks about their powder blue uniforms. Oh, yeah. And, but I mean, the food, man. <sighs> Eating good out there. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> like he, he said, he was worried about fitting in the seat on the way out there. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> did you see I'm, the size of those I burritos? Did. I did. I mean, he, was, he wasn't lying when he said that was the size of his forearm. I mean, he went traditional burrito, breakfast burrito, whatever cake or tr- you know sweet treat he had out there, and then I don't know what else did they have. Like I, that that drink that they had was. There were so many different things going on. Yeah, in that. yeah. I know. I'm pretty jealous. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at least at least they're not driving. You know, that's that's fair point. That's fair the, point. That's the safest part. That's so. the, that's the moral of the story. Yes. So, before we spend too much time talking about Paul's and his <laughs> vacation and making our own our own selves jealous tonight, yeah, of course. We, just to let everybody know, we do have a lot to talk about tonight. We're going to get into the Cavs and ha- just had the draft lottery. We're going to get Max' reaction, Peter's reaction to, and their thoughts on who we may select and some trade rumors surrounding the Cavs, not the ones that we have been used to here in Cleveland. Also get Max thoughts on the Browns and where they sit as we slowly inch our way to training camp and get through this NFL vacation or NFL players being on assignment right now. Of course, the Indians just wrapped up a series in Minnesota, a rough series up there, and thoughts out to Josh Naylor. A report came in that he did break a bone. He was carted off the field earlier today. Collision with second baseman Ernie Clement. So thoughts and prayers to a speedy recovery for him, but the injuries just keep continuing. We'll f- figure out where everybody is at, kind of with this Indians team. Just when will the injury bug really stop? And have some fun at the end of the show. <laughs> I have a fun topic for you guys. Uh, you know, Paulus has had the last few. He's kind of come up with them. I was, uh, you know, kind of enjoying a nice weekend away this weekend and got me thinking about favorite summer activities that you haven't, that you missed last summer especially, yeah. but things that you that you really want to get into. And we, we're getting close to July 4th, so one week away. Just to let everybody know, if you listen more to the beginning of the show than the end of the show, we will be off next week, but we'll still have a show. We're going to do a best of show next week for The Voice of Land, so be sure to tune in that. Some of the segments you may have missed, some of the best segments with some of our guest hosts, and maybe some rants between Paulus and myself. We'll see what we kind of come up with there. We're still piecing that one together, but be sure to tune into that, whether here on Twitter at VTL underscore pod, of course, on Facebook at Voice of Land. Of course, follow 
Big Play across all social media platforms, but you can always watch the live stream of our show and rewatch it throughout the week on their Facebook page and YouTube at Big Play Live. And catch the audio. You know where to get it. All your favorite podcast platforms. I don't got to rattle them off, but I will anyways. Google, <laughs> Spotify, and Apple. But let's jump right on in to this Cavs discussion. Cavs, in the draft lottery, they bump up into the top four. You're kind of seeing this more often with the reduction in chances when you have the worst record in the NBA. Now it's the top three, get 14 instead of the top or the worst team getting 25% chance to get the top pick. You're seeing some of these teams lower chances to get the top pick, at least jumping into the top four. And by all accounts, by all experts' accounts, top four is where you want to be. Cavs get the three pick, which is kind of a lot of people saying a sweet spot. Could be Evan Mobley, Jalen Suggs, Jalen Green. Even heard Kaminga as a, as an option there. Mac, I mean, just your reaction when the Cavs got the three pick is that is that really a sweet spot in your eyes? And who are you looking at? for the Cavs to pick up. Uh, I will say this. So I was in studio the night that the lottery happened mm. over at 92.3 The Fan. And for me, that that big benchmark was at least if you're in the top five. If you're in the top five, I think that you're fine. And, you know, like you said, you have Kaminga. Obviously, Cade Cunningham going number one, that, that would be the ideal scenario. But obviously, it didn't go the Cavs' way in that sense. And for me, it was just getting into the top five. That was a huge part. But the fact that they were able to get in the top four and able to get number three, Three was massive for them because, you know, obviously you're not going to get Cade Cunningham, but at least you're going to get one of those top guys knocked off the board for you. So it's almost like one less option for Kobe to, to mm. somehow find a way to screw it up. Right. Um, but, you know, I, I look at it as a, a, a win-win scenario for the Cavs because I look at this as this is going to make the best sense for the roster going forward. And I know we're going to get into the Colin Saxon discussion here in a little bit. I'm yeah. sure. I'm sorry to take that away from you. Oh, no, you're good. But um, looking at this, I think that the way that this is going to work for the for the roster, I think that Jalen Green is the best fit for this team. I think Evan Mobley is somebody who can be a good center and who I think can be a great modern big, but also currently doesn't necessarily have that three-point shot mm. currently at this point point. So I think that he's going to be somebody who, you know, I, I think is going to be a great pro, but I just don't think is the right fit for the Cavs currently. Because you have Jared Allen, I do still think that you need that stretch four, but I just don't think that that's on the roster, and I don't think that that's going to be Mobley. Um, but I I like Suggs, and I think that he's a great player. I just don't necessarily know if the immediate ball handle of, you know, Suggs, I, I just don't know if that's going to be the best fit. I think that he can be a good player on the Cavs. I just don't know if he's the exact perfect fit for this team. Whereas Jalen Green, I look at, he comes in, he's immediately your starting two. And I think that you have Darius Garland, who was excelling as a passer and a distributor last year, towards the end especially. He was finding his shot. So I think he's going to be your point guard of the future. Okoro was developing towards the end of uh, towards the end of April and May, and I think that for him, I think he will be your three. He will be your bona fide defender. He's going to cover whoever, whatever other team you're playing. They're number one. So I, I like Jalen Green because I think he takes the Kevin Porter Jr. scoring that you had. I think that he takes that without the off the court concerns, and I think that he's somebody who is still developing. He's also a few inches taller. Uh, uh, then Porter Jr. as well. So I think he's a better fit on the wing. And I think that overall, Jalen Green is going to be the best fit for this team going forward, especially as the offensive scorer on the Cavs team that was that finished last in three-point percentage last year. So I think that they're a team that really could use a Jalen Green and use that scorer and that scoring punch that I think has been missing because of the issues with Kevin Porter Jr. last year. I do think that Jalen Green will be the best fit for this team going forward as well. So going with Jalen Green, do you think that we're going to start to see an advantage to maybe playing in the G League first, choosing that out of high school, then college. Do you think that that, even though not a lot of people have been able to see Jalen Green, do you think that he has an advantage there already playing kind of any professional rank or playing against guys that are 
all looking for that spot up in the big show. And when you go and play college, not all those guys are – some of them already have or maybe even half of them have that eye to their future outside of the game. Is there any advantage for Jalen Green coming from the G League than these, some of these other guys coming out of college early on in this process? I think there's pros and cons to both because I think that all I think that what the G League is going to do is it's going to open up another viable uh, path for these uh, recruits to come out to. So I think that Jalen Green, the the reason why I worked for him, he was already a highly tied prospect to begin with. So for him, he got to be around NBA pros. Uh, Jared Jack and Amir Johnson were on his team. Now, obviously, they weren't great NBA players per se, but at the same time, they have that veteran leadership and they have that experience that they can go ahead and have. Have Jalen Green be able to use for the rest of his career. So for him, it, it's a great resource and a great tool early on, but at the same time, they only played for a few months, a couple months. So you have less games to show what you can do. Mm-hmm. And you're coming right from the high school level to the professional level. So it's a bit of an adjustment on a short window. So that's the that's the disadvantage for it. But again, the advantage is, like you said, you get to play in that environment and you get to go ahead and experience uh, being in the NBA uh, coaching. You can go ahead and have, you know, all of these different uh, areas and expertise open to you at that point. So I do think that there are pros and cons to both. But I think that what this does is it opens a viable option at least for these different recruits to come out to and not necessarily be forced into the NCAA um, what's the word I'm looking for the NCAA uh, transfer portal yeah basically mm-hmm. kind of like the NCAA environment kind of like their it, bubble and, yeah and basically how they set everything up and, yes you know there's of course there's all that stuff going on now about you know student athletes being right. paid or being able to you know get money off of how yeah they're basically being used to promote college sports and yet they're not going to see anything from that and then they get in trouble when they try to you know put themselves in a position because yeah their their education is being paid for and everything but Mm -hmm. they're not they don't have money for everything else that's and that's a deeper conversation as these as these court cases go on but you know, the NCAA, there is a wide range of schools that are in the NCAA yeah. and players that are trying to make a name for themselves, whether in football, basketball, soccer, what have you. And not all of them are going to go to the pros. Jalen Green is kind of in that pro rank. So, you know, he's going to almost kind of be the guinea pig for this because he's kind of one of those first ones that really is going to be a top pick and have a spotlight on him see how a guy like that reacts out of the G League versus these guys coming out of college. Peter, before we hit a break here, is there a guy that you're looking at for the Cavs or is there some is there a player, is there some sort of skill set that you're looking for that this Cavs team needs that you're just not seeing as they just kind of go through and are only winning 20, 21, 22 games a season. See, Mac probably doesn't know this, but you should remember, <laughs> I, I don't know anything about basketball. Uh, <laughs> so so when I look at the Cavs, I see, you know, they need the next LeBron James. Mm. <laughs> because, like, I, I loosely follow it. And, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. you know, listening to the games, a lot of times I'll listen to the games when I'm driving home from, from right. the show. Yeah, um, something we talk about all the time. Yeah, yeah. and it's... <laughs> The problem I had with like this year was they just they seemed like they just couldn't finish. They'd get to the end of the game, they'd be up or just right there, and then they would just the end of the fourth quarter they would just crumble, crumble. Yeah, yeah. Like this just ran out of gas. So I I'm not sure what they need, but man, they need something. Yeah, they, <laughs> I mean, I mean, what you're saying is I'm and I. I know it's we're not going to find the next LeBron like right away, mm-hmm. but you need that kind of player that's going to be able to go get theirs, help others, and make everyone around them better and kind of be a centerpiece of, you know that if a team is struggling offensively, maybe even defensively, you know you can go to that guy and any sort of scoring drought can be ended by that guy on the floor. Is that Jalen Green? Is that Jalen Suggs? Is that Evan Mobley? We'll get into that a little bit more on the other side of this break. I'll let you guys know who I want. 
while you're watching the show right now, or if you're listening or watching on replay, reach out to us at Kevin and Seven, at Mac Robinson ninety five, at LPV Productions, at VTL underscore Pod, wherever you want to on Twitter. Have these sports conversations. Who do you want? We'll get the poll results we posted as well here on the other side of the break. You are tuned in to the Voice of Land here on the Big Play Network. Whether you're looking to hire new talent or start a new career, Vector Technical has you covered. Vector Technical is a 28-year-old staffing firm that has helped thousands of job seekers advance in their career with reputable partners throughout Northeastern Ohio. Vector Technical is more than just a temp agency. With an above average hire in rate of one in four candidates, Vector works hard to connect the right person with the right opportunity the first time. Vector Technical hires for skilled manufacturing and light industrial work and is sure to have a career that you've been looking for. To learn more, visit our website at www.vectortechnicalinc.com. Welcome back inside the voice of the land here on the Big Play Network. Kevin on the long side, our special guest host, Mac Robinson, and, of course, our producer extraordinaire, Peter Tellup. And before we hit the break, we were talking about Cavs' three-pick coming up on July 29th, 2021, NBA Draft. Who do we want? We know that Cade Cunningham is pretty much if all but a lock to Detroit. <laughs> I mean, I, pretty much he's only going to meet with the Pistons. He said he was only going to – the report was he's only going to meet with the team with the number one pick. So – well, and not to mention, too, I mean, the Detroit fans, and and you know this, I, I have family up in Detroit. Yes. I constantly will like follow along with different Detroit fans. Sorry about that. Uh, but different Detroit fans, and they've already got the great nickname for mm. him. It's the Motorcade. And so at that point, like, uh, it, it makes... The Motor City with the Motorcade. The Motorcade, it, it makes motor so city. much sense it that does. if they don't, I'm going to be upset. From a, from a nickname standpoint and everything, I'm going to be upset. Motorcade rolling through the Motor City. I mean, <laughs> taking them to places they haven't been in a while. That Yeah. It just, that fits. I haven't heard that yet, but I've also, you know, I haven't really been connected with over the weekend. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, I haven't even caught up with our poll results, which, I, you know, I looked up in the break. That's the first time I've actually been looking. Because <laughs> we uh, we posted on, uh, on our Twitter page our poll of the week, sponsored, of course, by Vector Technical. Right person, right job, the first time. Uh, Cavs, of course, got the three pick. Assuming Cade Cunningham, motorcade, goes to Detroit, who is your guy at three? And we had uh, a lot of votes came in, and 39% Jalen Green. The other options we had were Evan Mobley, Jalen Suggs, and, of course, did leave the option open for other. Um, the, uh, the confetti... At I carry nunchucks responded to us because <laughs> we did say to comment below that he said he wanted Jonathan Kaminga he wanted an athletic forward, uh, but uh, Jalen Suggs was second in the actual voting at thirty percent and then Evan Mobley twenty eight percent so pretty it's pretty close amongst the the viewing audience. Mm-hmm. I mean the guy I really like is is Jalen Suggs but. That's so difficult to say for this team because we've gone guard, 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 guard. It, you know, it's either guard, 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 or center, 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 center. Right. There's nothing in between. The guy that's really in between, you can't get. The closest to that would be, like you said, Jalen Green. Yeah. I don't. If they really have their eye on Jared Allen as their center of the future. That that was one of their centerpieces of that trade. Pun intended? For, pun intended. <laughs> pun intended, absolutely. You know it. You know, hey, we always used to say words are hard, but oh, so fun. Absolutely. Gotta have fun. <laughs> <laughs> fun, fun with the puns, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. But, I mean, honestly, Evan Mobley, I mean, I watched a little bit of USC. I can't say that I watched a lot, but, I mean, they're on the West Coast. Mm-hmm. Watched them in the tournament. The Mobley brother, brothers working together just seemed to be a good pairing. Yeah. I'm not saying the question is, can Mobley play without his brother, but what can he be on this stage? And you may already have that guy anyways. Again, if this front office really liked that they got Jared Allen in that trade, why would you go Evan Mobley then? Or do you want to go with the, you know, like the two centers in the middle? Do you want that kind of length? I don't, I don't know if you need that. You need, you need guys on the wing. You need athletic guys on the wing. And I yeah. think out of those three, 
Jalen Suggs, Jalen Green, and Evan Mobley, the guy you would go to is Jalen Green. All you, if that is the guy, though, boy, you have to hope that Houston goes Mobley. Yeah, and, and to be quite honest, I think that they do go Mobley, um, mainly because I think that Mobley is – as many have called him, the the great modern big. You know, it, it, with what you're looking for out of Mobley, he's somebody who can run the floor, he can pass, he can dribble, he can mm-hmm. distribute. He's somebody who can really be a threat at all levels. Like I said, the only thing is just he's working on that three-point shot. Yeah. He only shot 30% this past year. So I think that Mobley is somebody who's a viable option. If the Cavs took him, I'd be happy. The only problem is just that it's going to take him a little bit of time just because, keep in mind, Darius Garland is 205 pounds. Evan Mobley's 215. So he's going to have to put on some weight, and I don't doubt that he's going to be able to. Right. But at the same time, you know, I, I've seen and heard some people saying that maybe early on he can be almost that Chris Bosch type of four where he can be that scorer on the outside a little mm-hmm. bit, but he can also got, kind of go low. My only problem with that is that in today's modern NBA where it's all about spacing, you know, Jared Allen really doesn't provide that on the outside. Right. That's not what he's meant to do. So that's why I just don't think it's a, a good fit. And Kamingo was the other one that was thrown in there too. Yeah, Kaminga I like, but the problem is, is that he's he's not 19 yet, which is phenomenal, but the problem is is that he he's really raw at a lot of spots in his game. Now, he's very coachable, he's good on defense, but, you know, the scoring, I think, is going to take a little bit of time, but I think that overall, you, you kind of did that last year with Isaac Okoro. Now, obviously, a smaller player, and he's a wing player, but... Kaminga's basically, I, I kind of look at him similar to what you had what you had to do last year with Okoro, but at your four spot. So I, I look at it as, like you said, between Suggs and you got Jalen Green. I think Jalen Green is, out of the two, obviously, I think he is the traditional wing. He is the guy who's going to be able to score on the outside. He'll be able to take care of uh, the ball and really be able to be your go-to scorer where, like what Peter was saying, where coming down late in the fourth quarter, it just seemed like the Cavs kind of evaporated, mm-hmm. you know. I look at Jalen Green as being that lead scorer for the team and the player that this team can actually identify with and actually be able to utilize in the offense and center the offense around. And I think that Darius Garland will be able to feed off of that as well, be able to score on his own. I just think that Jalen Green makes too much sense for this team. And other people have said, you know, if you didn't have a Cade Cunningham, then, you know, Evan Mobley in most years would be a slam dunk number one overall pick. Jalen Green would be a slam dunk number one overall pick, and he would be he would have the highest upside. But again, just because you have Cade Cunningham, yeah. who's a potential all pro, right. then yeah, okay, you're going to have Cade go number one. So Jalen Green is somebody who I think makes so much sense and I think has the upside that you need to absolutely justify taking him there. Yeah. And now looking at this draft, I think Houston is, even if they take Mobley, they're in the driver's seat in this draft because Detroit has the easy option at number one. Right. Then. I think the advantage of being in the top four is you are still getting a good talent. Even even if everybody disagrees with us about Jalen Green. <laughs> right. We're going to be happy with Evan Mobley, with Jalen Suggs. Yeah. Players like that because we, from all accounts and watching them play, they are good players. Right. Houston is in that driver's seat because they get the pick of all of them. Right. Of course, next is Cleveland because then you get the pick of who's left. That's great before the fourth pick. So yeah. there's still an advantage there. you I do want to just say, just yeah. to be clear, whoever the Cavs take, I'm going to be happy yeah. with. I'm Because, like I said, I just want to be in the top five. Now, if they select somebody outside of the top five, I'm going to be critical of it, and I'm going to question it a little bit. Now, I know Scotty Barnes is somebody who's gotten mentioned, and I think that he's an interesting player. Personally, I, I wouldn't go down the Scotty Barnes route, but I can understand why some people like him. But... Whoever they select at, at three, I'm mm. going to probably be happy with it. Again, unless they absolutely throw me for a loop yeah. and just take somebody out of, like, Australia or somebody random completely, okay, fine. Like, then, okay, maybe I'll get that. Or Slovenia, I don't know. Like, they pull somebody completely randomly out of a hat. Then at that point, yeah, I'm going to be critical. But the main five names, I'm happy where they're at. Yeah, if there's <laughs> the only way I'm going to be upset is if again, if it's a name that we aren't even looking at, thinking about, they're f- further down the list like number 1 Anthony Bennett. That, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, like you can't you can't go down that route. Now of course yes. we're going to root for the guy and and see what he can do cuz Again, it's it's draft stuff, so who yeah. knows? There right. might be a guy that comes out. You've had people, players lower in the draft, make 
make big plays and make a big name for themselves in the league, even though that they weren't touted as ever becoming something like that. Now, we've kind of mentioned Jalen Green pairing with Darius Garland, but there's a name we're kind of leaving out. Yes. Who is now rumored to being explored to being traded. Yes. And that is one who we are big fans of, Paulus and myself, big fans of, big stands of here on the Voice of Land, Colin Sexton. Where do you stand? Do the Cavs need to trade Colin Sexton, or is it just a necessary, un, an unfortunate, unfortunate necessary thing that they need to look at with the players that are available in this draft that may be a little bit better and may be able to do a little bit more to build a winning culture and not just be a big time score. I look at so okay so let me start off by just saying this with Colin Sexton mm-hmm. because I, I want to be clear that I'm not just somebody who's coming out just to hate Colin Sexton and all this and all this mm. stuff you know I, I look at Colin Sexton's game and in covering in covering game uh, for the station too I was able to watch him last year too and I like Colin Sexton's game the problem is is that the same issues that he had in his rookie year in his sophomore year this past year you know they still constantly keep on coming up when the game gets to its clutch moments. So the problems with Colin are that he gets very tunnel vision. And I, I, I... I joke with some people saying that our problem is, is that our lead scorer has a, has a vision of Trent Richardson because literally all he does is just get tunnel vision yeah. for going to the basket. And yes, he will. He will get assists. He will distribute the ball. I'm not saying that he doesn't. But at the same time that when it comes down to it, it's I'm going to go ahead and put the team on my back, even if there's other players that are wide open. And. I'm sorry, but I'm I would be more okay with that if somebody had the the frame of a Jalen Green who's six mm. six. And the other problem that I have is that when Garland and Sexton are on the court together, it seems like it's very choppy. And mm. I I don't want to say stagnant, but because Garland, when he takes up when he takes the ball up the court, it's very smooth, and he's able to distribute well. He's able to score on his own, but he's able to look and always is looking to pass along with getting the score for himself. Right. Whereas when it comes to Colin, Colin will occasionally make the pass, but again, every time it just seems like if there's a pick and roll, he's going to roll and he's going to head to the basket and he's going to try to take some hard contact and throw the ball up to the hoop. So. Colin, I feel like, hasn't necessarily grown as much. And to be quite honest, I'm weary of giving him an extension. And I look at Colin Sexton as somebody who can be a great six man on a good on a playoff team. So if he were willing to be that, okay, fine. But I'm also not willing to pay that guy twenty million dollars. Right. So that's the problem that we're kind of running into at this point. So I look at Colin Sexton as okay, this is our main tradable asset. Now I think that Kobe Allman, they've talked about, you know, looking to make that next step, make that jump. And I think that whoever they pick at three, they're gonna use as that centerpiece. And that's also why I said Jalen Green. I think he can be that centerpiece of your team. So at that point, I would trade Colin Sexton. I would trade your 2022 first round pick. Hell, if I need to, trade your 2024 first round pick and go ahead and see who you can bring in. You have Torian Prince on an expiring deal. You have the Chetty Osmond money, who if somebody's willing to take that, please, God, take it. Um, and at the same time, you know, uh, you still have the Kevin Love situation. But at the same time, I think that'll take an asset to, to move off of as yes. well. But. The way that I see it, you take Colin Sexton, you take first round picks and you move it for somebody, move it for a potential star that may be disgruntled. So I I look at and this is just one situation. I do not know. I don't have insider info on this, (laughs) but I I would look at Toronto. And there were rumors at the trade deadline last year where Nick Nurse and Pascal Siakam got into an altercation in the locker room. And I would go ahead and call up Toronto, just say, look, I I understand that there was everything with Siakam before. Would you be willing to take Colin? after Kyle Lowry is heading free agency, we'll give you Colin, we'll give you a couple first-round picks, we'll give you an expiring deal, a role player in Chetty. At that point, you can get out of that long-term deal mm-hmm. and long-term commitment with Siakam, and all of a sudden now, your starting lineup becomes Darius Garland, uh, Jalen Green, Isaac Okoro, Pascal Siakam, and Jared Allen. Sounds pretty good. Exactly, <laughs> exactly my point. But like put that, me in a dream world, right? Right, like, that's what not I mean. Not necessarily a dream world, but at least like a... Like a 
at, nice basketball dream world, you know? Yeah, and, and at that point, that's where you can utilize the free the free agent money that you have yeah. to bring in somebody like a veteran. So, again, going into the postseason uh, press conference that, um, that Kobe Altman had said, you know, he came out and likened them to where the Suns and the Hawks were, which, again, I think was just, you know, romanticizing, hey, we're getting to that point. But at the same time, my issue that I had was they had their centerpiece. Yeah. The Cavs don't have their centerpiece. Now, once you get Jalen Green, the Cavs might be benefiting because they were able to build the rest of their team. And now they bring in the centerpiece all of a sudden to make it work. And you have him for another four, possibly seven or eight years at that point to have him under contract. So I, I look at it as you bring in that uh, you bring in your centerpiece and then you can bring in the veterans like what Atlanta did last year, bringing in Danilo Gallinari, bring yeah. in Lou Williams and bring in a few other veterans. And all of a sudden now this Cavs team makes a lot of sense, which is something that I haven't really been able to say for a while now. Well, and that also goes to what Kobe Altman has been saying is they want to expedite this process of rebuild and getting to competition yes. level, competing for not just the eight or the playing tournament, whatever they're doing now yeah. in the NBA. Right. I mean, that is becoming the new NBA purgatory. They're trying, <laughs> what he is saying is they're trying to compete for the top and be a winning organization again. Yes. I think part of that is they're still trying to prove that they can do it without LeBron James specifically, not a guy like LeBron James, LeBron James himself. Mm -hmm. But in terms of Colin Sexton, all I'll say is, yes, I am a fan of Colin Sexton, and but I understand if they trade him away. Will I like it? No, but I'm not going to like I do with Space Jam on the show. <laughs> I'm not going to pound the table and say that we need to keep Colin Sexton because I understand the business. If they keep Colin Sexton and extend him because of a lot of the fans on Twitter and out there in Cavs universe that are big Colin Sexton fans that are saying you got to keep him, you got to he's got to be here. If you're doing what the fans want, then that's when you go end up sitting with them. That's the common adage. You do what the fans want, <laughs> you end up sitting with them. Yeah. And not in a job that you are meant for or supposed to be in, in a professional sports organization's front office. So it just looks like the two guys that I'm looking at, Jalen Green, Jalen Suggs, you're looking at Jalen Green, those guys, you bring one of them in, how does the, the three of them I can't see how that would work. Darius Garland keeping Colin Sexton and having Jalen Green or Jalen Suggs. Suggs is kind of more, you know, hinting at the Darius Garland spot. Green is the Colin Sexton spot. I think you may have, I think it's time you may have to split up Garland and Sexton. And get rid of this stupid sex land thing that's going all over the place. Look, man, and I will say this. I am going to be disappointed to see sex land go. I am going to be terribly disappointed to see yeah. sex land go. But at hey, the same... <laughs> yeah, it needs the... Like, hey, come on, man. Yeah. It's fun. It's fun. It's, oh, it's... I I love it, man. I love a little I, bit of fun. I know. It's fine. It, but it's, like, it's fun to a point, but then people take it too far. And, they, you know, everybody always takes advantage of those things. Uh, of course, of course. But, I mean, y you can only do that in sex land. But, you know, at the same... <laughs> this is a family show, right? <laughs> I, I never said it wasn't. <laughs> but at the, same, at the same time, <laughs> at the same time, though, I, I will say I do disagree to an extent with the, with the Jalen Suggs-Darius uh, Garland breakup. Because I do think that Suggs can play a little bit off ball. But I just think that it's a little bit more of a, of a quirky fit between him yeah. and, and Garland. I think Garland is a, is a good distributor and he can be somebody who can lead, the, he can lead up the court. Not to say that Green isn't. Right. But at the same time, I think it's a little bit more of a natural fit between the two natural one and two even though it's positionless basketball right it's it's a little bit more of a natural connection yes on paper again on paper only leads you so far and <laughs> yeah but i'm looking at you got to pick a guy i don't want to trade for a veteran unless you're adding to what you pick up in the mm -hmm. draft that's where i'm at with that but another team that on paper looks like they can do a lot the Cleveland Browns. We're going to get Max thoughts on them here on the other side of this break, but be sure to tune in to this break specifically because we keep talking about it. You want that voice of land gear. We will tell you exactly where to get that, especially to get your Paulus Fu Manchu 
t-shirt as well that we added there. I'm going to have to figure out a shirt that I don't know if I need to change up my look or something, get like my <laughs> face on a t-shirt, but we'll see. But you <laughs> will have all that information on the other side of this break here on The Voice of Land on the Big Play Network. Are you struggling to hire the right talent or maybe even find the right career? Vector Technical makes it easy. Since 1992, Vector has provided Ohio employers with a reliable process for hiring and have helped thousands of job seekers advance in their careers. Vector Technical is more than just a temp agency. We invest time to get to know each client and candidate personally. Vector places people in job opportunities that they are truly excited about. Interested in learning more? Visit our website at www.vectortechnicalinc.com to see a full list of our current job opportunities and to find out what Vector Technical can offer you. Get your gear at voiceoftheland.com forward slash shop. Welcome back to The Voice of Land here on the Big Play Network and partner with LPV Productions. Kevin Earl, alongside our special guest host, Mac, in his somewhat Mac corner that we tried to set up for you, <laughs> filling in for Paulus, who's on assignment this week. Are, are, you, are you liking your version of Mac, uh, the Mac corner over there? It, it, it feels nice. It feels nice. I, I'm not going to lie. You guys were accommodating. I appreciate it. it it's, it's nice. I appreciate it. Those that didn't tune into the Ohio Media School All Sports Cleveland uh, <laughs> Network, of course, Mac, we used to do a show, Mac Corner, which came from our draft coverage oh, of yes. the uh, 2018 draft when one Baker Mayfield was selected for the Cleveland Browns. And uh, Mac was rattling off those stats and information on oh, all yeah, these man. guys. Like he's, He is one guy to go to, especially during draft time and throughout Brown season, football season, NFL. Uh, of course, follow him at Mac Robinson 95 on Twitter. You'll get all that information on there. But we kind of stuck him in a corner at the restaurant we were in and then uh, people were trying to sit in his corner the next day and it was, was not having it just took off from there <laughs> yeah you weren't having it at all <laughs> just took off from there so and of course behind that proverbial, proverbial glass as we say Peter Tellup is here as well and we went to break of course kind of talking calves but we got the NFL guy and the Browns guy with us here tonight and just a couple questions for you because there's really not a lot going on. Tight right. end university is going on right now with all the tight ends in the league, but there's not a lot of storylines. Everybody still is going to the Baker contract. Will it or won't it happen? Um, what are your thoughts on will the Browns actually do it or should they do it this offseason? And in addition to with Baker, there was an article out today by Terry Pluto, I believe, of uh, – Cleveland.com, mm -hmm. the Cleveland Plain Dealer, of course, those days as well. Basically calling, I haven't read the whole thing, but it was basically calling Baker Mayfield a system quarterback, but that's okay for the Cleveland Browns. Do they, Should the Browns extend Baker, and are they extending a system quarterback or not? So, uh, okay, I'll start off by answering the will they um, or will they and should they this offseason? And I say the answer is yes to both, um, mainly because I think that for Baker, he hasn't had. Obviously, we, we've known this, but Baker hasn't had the same coaching staff until this year uh, going in back to back seasons. So I, I look at it as. Baker's second year. This is really his second year in development. You know, I almost look at, uh, I almost look at his sophomore year as a as a negative year. Mm -hmm. So it almost subtracts a year basically. Uh, so it brought him back to square one. Um, so I, I look at it as yes, you extend Baker. Basically, I, I look at it similar to the Miles Garrett situation last year. So Miles obviously had his incident with Mason Rudolph, had his suspension, and they ended up extending him, giving him the the largest guarantee. Uh, and the largest contract for a defensive player in the history of the league. And that lasted about four days until Joey Bosa got his extension. So basically, I look at this as if you go ahead, get ahead of this, all of a sudden your rook your uh, record deal mm. becomes, you know, cheap 
by the time that you get two or three contracts down the line, especially when we're talking quarterback. So I, I look at Baker's contract. I think that they're going to extend him. I think it's going to happen here relatively soon. Um, and, and I do think that it will happen. I do think that they should that they should extend him. Now, as for the Terry Pluto article, I didn't get a chance to read it. I did see it. I I just haven't got a chance to read it today. Yeah. Um, but the whole system quarterback moniker for Baker, I can understand it, but I will say this. I don't think that that's really a, a knock on him. Right. You know, there are certain ones where, you know, a game manager or certain things – that might be a, a knock on certain quarterbacks, mainly because, you know, they might not necessarily be aggressive. But a system quarterback, all that tells me is that you have good coaching because your coaches are adjusting their system to the quarterback and his strengths, which right. is what you're trying to do. Right. I mean, uh, unless we're unless we're trying to put our quarterbacks in the worst situation possible. Like we did since 1999. Uh, yes, exactly. Before well, Baker. Well, yeah. <laughs> and Kevin Savansky. Uh, right. Coach Kev. Right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I look at it as, you know, it's not really a a right. disappointment, you know, for Baker. And I think is a system quarterback fair. But I also think a system for your quarterback should be what we aim for at this point. And it shows that Stefanski and the rest of the offensive coaches, Alex Van Pelt, um, you know, all of those guys have really been building that offense to make sense for the personnel that they have. They have Nick Chubb, they have Kareem Hunt, and they have, obviously, Odell and Jarvis. I I look at the offense and think it makes sense for what they're trying to do. Now, the other part of this, too, is that people have brought up, you know, the run game, everything like that. I I look at it as by the end of last year, you saw that they leaned on the run game heavy in the first part of the season, mainly because Baker was getting adjusted to it. It takes a while. It took Kirk Cousins a year and a half to get used to it. It took Baker eight games and no offseason. So all of a sudden, by the second half of the year, they were expanding the passes more. They were expanding the offense more, letting Baker do a little more, give him a little bit of a longer lead. And you saw Baker be able to take advantage of that. And so I think that you're going to see that next step from Baker this year because, again, it's another year. You give him a full offseason with him being able to be around the coaches as well and around his teammates as well. I think that this is going to be another step for Baker Mayfield. And so I do just think that you go ahead, get that price tag low now while you can Mm -hmm. before Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson, who have – proven, at least in the NFL, that they can be successful. They can be successful with their coaching staffs. And Baker now, if you get him in year two and he's able to take that next step, all of a sudden now you're going to have to pay him alongside those numbers instead of maybe getting him for a slight bargain if you put your trust in him and go ahead and pay him first. Yeah, and I mean, you brought up and you talked about how system quarterback is is not a bad thing. And we talked last week, Paulus and I talked about how Baker – and the Browns, the extension needs to get done. I mean, yeah. he's he's the guy. Everybody that in the national media that wants to keep, you know, throwing stones and just just trying to get clicks and likes and, and yeah. get the trolls out there and, and troll everybody else. And they know Cleveland's going to respond to it. They're trying to get everybody to retweet their stuff, and they know Cleveland fans will. Right. Baker Mayfield's polarizing. It's going to. It just comes with the territory. But just keeping everything in house. He's he's their guy. Extend him. And like you said, I mean, doing it this year, he can set the market. And then, you know, if you got what you think you got in that guy and he continues to show it now, as you said, bargain on the market in terms of system quarterback. Baker, of course, gets lumped in with what he did at Oklahoma, you know, quick out of the shotgun, you know, having those tight ends. Well, the Browns have the tight ends. They have running backs that can, you know, help him out of the backfield. They have playmakers on the outside. Baker can make all the throws, but if you know things break down, they have the plays in place, as you saw. And I go back to that Jarvis Landry play in the playoff game where a short little pass, you let your playmaker make the play. So a coaching staff, like how crazy is this in the city of Cleveland? A coaching staff taking the talent they have and building an offense and a system around them. Yeah, if you want to call Baker Mayfield a system quarterback, then that's fine. And I think Terry Pluto was saying that exact same thing that you just said. You know, system quarterback, and that's A-OK. It (laughs) doesn't have to come with any sort of negative moniker anymore. If a system quarterback is doing what you need them to do and is helping lead you into possibly beating who won the AFC, you were that close to beating them. 
a guy can do something like that in year one under that system when his confidence was just being reboosted and he was finding himself and then finding how he can utilize elements of the offense to best fit his skill set coming off of that into this year now all of the offense is back together the coaching staff is back together the weapons are still all around him now they can just take that next step instead of having to reset the language the the players meeting each other for the first time (laughs) all of that can be pushed to the side and you can take that next step this season Uh, again system quarterback fine I mean yeah he wins games for us that's all we want here in the city of Cleveland. Real quick before our break, Mac, the other question I wanted to get your quick thoughts on, what do you see this defense being this year? Do you see them more so of last year being a sieve, or do you really see this 4 5 potential having that ability to take on the way that NFL offenses have progressed over the years and being able to stem the tide and be that dominant force out there. I think it all depends on how long it takes this defense to gel because that's going to be what I'm going to be focused on throughout the throughout training camp, throughout the preseason, in the early stages of the, of the football season. I look at the way that this defense is set up, and like you said, on paper, it's, it's great. But again, we have to see how that develops because I genuinely look at this and think that regarding the way that this defense is set up, and uh, I can't remember, Steve Wilkes, mm. um, two years ago, defense <laughs> coordinator, completely flushed the 2019 season out of my head, thankfully. We flushed a lot of seasons out of our heads. Yes, we did. Uh, but in the 2019 season, you know, he talked about wanting to run that 4-2-5 defense, and I I just didn't think at the time that they had the personnel to do it. You know, Mm -hmm. you had Jermaine Whitehead who was trying to play in that safety role as well. But now you genuinely, you can decide, okay, do you want to run a 4-2-5? Do you want to run that with three corners or three safeties? Do you want to go ahead and run two linebackers? Or do you want to do you want to run dime defense with only one linebacker out there and you can run three safeties and three and three corners? You genuinely have the versatility between on this defense up and down. Uh, on the defensive line, you have Clowney who can play on the edge or who can kick inside. You know, you have Malik Jackson who can do the same thing. Mm-hmm. And there's versatility all along this defense. I don't see it being a sieve. You know, maybe early on they play a little vanilla. But I think that once this defense gels, I think you're looking at a team that could be top 10 in defense this year, genuinely, with this talent. And that's where Paulus and I were were at last week. Like It may take a few weeks for this defense to show what they can be because it's going to take a little bit more time for them, being first year all together and so many new pieces. And that's the biggest question mark. You know, how can they kind of, you know, win games? The offense is going to be having some blowouts in these initial, initial games. But... I think after the first couple, once they kind of get the communication and get an understanding of each other and where they're going to be, again, this defense can translate what looks like on paper to be dominant, to be in the, between those four white lines, to be physically and mentally dominant against their opponents this season. We are going to hit our final break of the evening here. Uh, on the other side, quick thoughts maybe on the Indians. Do want to uh, send our best again out to Josh Naylor. We'll get into that quickly on the other side. And top three summer activities you may have missed last year or just overall, um, especially heading into a long holiday weekend next weekend, taking advantage of that nice weather. What are those summer activities you look forward to every single June, July, August, and even September? We'll get into that on the other side. This is The Voice of Land on the Big Play Network. Are you looking for a career in manufacturing? Vector Technical has you covered. Vector Technical is a 28-year-old staffing firm that has partnered with some of the biggest and the best companies throughout Northeastern Ohio. The recruiters at Vector Technical will coach you through the entire job process and will help you land an opportunity that you are truly excited about. Vector does not add any additional fees and offers benefits as well as free online skills training through Penn Foster. To learn more, visit www.vectortechnicalinc.com and make sure to check out our job board to see a full list of our current opportunities and apply. And welcome back to The Voice of Land for our final segment of the evening. Of course, it's usually our fun segment of the evening. We're having fun with words throughout the show. We'll have a little bit more fun to end the show. But, of course, have to start with a little bit less 
fun topic right now. And again, from our Voice of Land family out to the Indians organization, and of course, Josh Naylor as well, wishing him a speedy recovery. Of course, uh, collision out there in the outfield trying to make a play with second baseman Ernie Clement. Uh, Terry Francona did mention to the media after the game that he did break a bone. They did not specify which one, uh, but according to our uh, doctor affiliation on the show, Dr. Jana, our physical therapist, that, you know, any sort of broken bone, that's, you know, six to eight weeks at least that you're looking at there. Well, we'll get the official word from the Indians, I'm sure, in uh, maybe this evening or later on this week before they uh, play their games this week, heading into the holiday weekend. Mac, I mean, it it just seems like it's been a roller coaster. We, we yeah. kind of had the running uh, bit here on the show that, <laughs> you know, like, who are the Indians? Like the common, the, the who song, like, who are you? Who, who? <laughs> um, you know, still trying to figure out who they are, but they've been able to stay above 500 around that nine, 10 games above 500, a rough weekend against you know, a twins team that has not met any sort of expectations bottom of the AL central. And again, they were able to win a couple games because of pitching staff, you don't even have any of your starters from opening day. You're hoping to get police back. And of course in your lineup frame, El Reyes, but another bat in your lineup goes down today. I mean, it, it's it's one of the, it's one of the toughest seasons I've seen in a while in baseball. I don't know where you're at. Well, I think that we can finally I think we finally found a name to call the Indians now or Cle- the Cleveland baseball team now, and that's the Cleveland Clippers because that's pretty much been the entire roster yeah. that you've seen at this point. You know, I mean, Ernie Clement we covered back when we used to cover the captains' games, and you know, I look at that I, that injury genuinely like I I had to catch the replay because mm-hmm. uh, I didn't watch it live, but. I mean, that might yeah. be the worst injury that I've ever seen, uh, yeah. at least the worst collision sports injury period that yeah. I've, I've ever seen. And so, you know, I genuinely, you know, like you said, speedy recovery to Naylor. But uh, I think that at this point, you, you call up Daniel Johnson. I think that, you know, I believe on Friday he hit his ninth home run of the season. Yeah. So I think he's going to be somebody who's a candidate uh, to get called up. Um, you know, there's been a possibility that you can call up Nolan Jones, but I don't think that they're going to do that because of a, because of an injury. Shout um, double A, by the way. Nolan Jones! Jones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I like I like Nolan, but I just don't think I don't think he's an outfielder either. No. But um, but at the same time, you know, I think that they're going to utilize Daniel Johnson, get him called up. But I also think that, you know, once Luplo uh, gets ready to go, I think that all of a sudden I think he will be somebody who can get the uh, or at least get moved to t- the 10 day deal. I know he got shifted before. Yeah, he got shifted to 60. But I, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'd. I didn't even rec- realize that he was, you know, on the. It's just, it's, yeah. You're going through so many injuries. You right. forget about the ones that started the season. Yeah, and, and this goes back to uh, my my bigger problem with with the Indians going into this year, you know, and that was the fact that I feel like Chris Antonetti somewhat mismanaged this roster. Mm-hmm. Um, and look, he's done a great job with what he's done overall, but at the same time, I look back at the two major trades that they've made, the last two, I should say, between the Mike. Clive Avenger deal last year, and then you have the deal this year uh, with Francisco Lindor. And the two biggest issues that I have with it is that, you know, your biggest, your, at least when it comes to the organization, you really don't develop your own outfielders. You no. know, it, you, the Indians haven't really developed an outfielder that I can remember. You know, your your best ones were coming from trades and prospects that came from other organizations. And hell, even Josh Naylor was somebody who was a first baseman who was moved to the outfield last year by the Padres, and then the Indians kept them there. So, you know, I, I look at the Indians and thinking, okay, you know for a fact that you really can't develop outfielders. It's it's one of your weak spots, at least recognizing that everybody has one. The Indian yeah. strength is pitching. That's a common theme on this show that we talk about all the time. can develop pitching, but you can't develop outfield. Right, and so the problem that I had with it was that you had you got Gabriel Arias uh, in the deal, another player that we used to cover, but at the same time, he was somebody, talented infielder, great. You got him, Owen Miller, a talented infielder, great, phenomenal. And then your next deal, you acquire Ahmed Rosario, which, again, 
again, he's playing phenomenally. I don't hate trading for him. But the problem is that the centerpiece was uh, Andres Jimenez. And so at that point, you have another middle infielder. I'm okay with getting those top guys if they're in single A and you have time to develop them into outfielders or develop them into other positions. But if they're major league ready, you're not going to switch them. You're not going to have them switch positions that got them to that point. Right. So I I just didn't understand the roster construction behind that. You know, I can understand getting the pitching and everything like that. But when you're getting all these middle infielders and on top of that, you still have Tyler Freeman who's coming up. He he's obviously obviously been dealing with a sore shoulder these last couple weeks but you know at the same time you know these players it's it's all of a sudden now now you're seeing the issues you have Owen Miller who came out for a little bit he couldn't hit but also he was kept in the infield again you have Eddie Rosario who you're focused on you're now trotting out Bradley Zimmer the seventh year senior at this point you know I I look at the way that this roster has been constructed and I just think that it's flawed and look like again like I said Antonite is doing the best that he can but when that's your that's one of your star pitchers and your centerpiece yeah. shortstop you got to do better than getting just a bunch of infielders that are major league ready yeah i mean peter it's it, it it's turned into from a, us kind of joking around like who is this team really going to be will they actually contend or not to i mean really like who are who are these guys cuz we're trying to we're trying to learn about them mac and i covered the captains so we've kind of seen some of them but now we're just trying to put guys in random spots just to get their bat up here. And we're, it's the injuries just so tough to, to watch from, from afar. It's been fun to watch baseball, but tough to just kind of see those new notifications come through every single day. I, I, don't, I don't think I can remember a year that the Indians have had this many injuries. I mean, yeah. our, I can't really think of a team that's had this many. Yeah, injuries. I mean, the, the pitching, the our pitching staff is decimated, you know, and and yet I before the show I went through and I think and I looked up the you know June, and I think they're twelve and nine in June. So <laughs> it, with all the issues that they've had, yeah. you know, the 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 bats are either hot or cold, you know, injuries, the the pitching, you know, they bring up some prospects for pitching. Um, you know, maybe the prospects do okay, but they're limited on pitch count. Yeah. So then we're into the bullpen already. Yeah. So we're really putting a lot of wear and tear in the bullpen. And yet somehow, you know, they're only two games back. I know. <laughs> so, right. You know, and I was looking and, and um, the bottom three teams, you know, in the, uh, in the AL, they're, they're all like 11 games back. Yeah. I mean, we have a pretty good cushion there. Yeah. And we're only two games back. It's, it's, it's yeah. ludicrous actually how, you know, the team, this is almost like, you know, are they going to get to the playoffs potentially? Might might we actually have some healthy people and, you know, we do well because because we've had nothing but adversity all year? I don't know. Yeah, yeah it really tests the metal of, of your mental state yeah. and the metal of a team, how they're going to get through these kind of things. Again, we keep saying it that having Terry Francona at the helm is the guy you want. And it's just, it's amazing that they've been able to stay above 500 and how they've done it to this point of the season, almost three months into it. And, I mean, yeah, you could have made up ground against the White Sox who are struggling right now, so that's the downside. Mm -hmm. But yet you're still there to give yourself a chance if they can find a way to piece things together. And as guys slowly start to come back... I mean, you could really take a run. Well, the other part of this, too, that makes it so difficult because if we're a couple weeks or like a month away from the deadline. What do you do? How do you evaluate your own team? And and the one thing that I'm going that I'm going to hate is that. You know, if I'm the Indians, I would it wouldn't stop stop me from, you know, at least calling up like Arizona, who has lost what, like fifty out of the last fifty-five yeah, uh, yeah. total or yeah. something like that. So it wouldn't stop me from calling them up and asking for the availability of of uh Cattell Marte, mm. uh the outfielder. You know, maybe see if he's available and seeing who you can bring in. Yeah. But at the same time, like it, 
I, I do worry to an extent that, you know, Antonetti and the Dolans basically are going to end up saying like, well, hey, we're getting Fran Mill Reyes back. We're getting Jordan Luplo back. Those are our trade deadline acquisitions. And we didn't give anything up for them. Great. OK, cool. Yeah. Like I, I, I right. hear the excuse built in. But at the same time, if I'm the Indians, it wouldn't stop me from at least going after these guys. But at the same time, I understand it with so much of that lineup decimated. Yeah, if they see the writing on the wall that their contention time is kind of up and their window's closing, then you're going to see something like that. If they're really looking to contend, they're going to at least call to other teams. And again, not looking for a Hall of Famer or an all-star, a viable, above-average Major League Baseball player that is not on the track of going between AAA and major leagues, like uh, just a viable, above-average major league player that you can put out there that is going to be consistent for you moving forward. Can I just say, I, I wish he wasn't a rookie, but Cedric Mullins for the for the Orioles, he has played so mm-hmm. dang well. Mm-hmm. And he's batted above 300. You know, he's got a ton of steals. He's got home runs this year. Plays phenomenal center field defense. I wish, I, I wish that we had that, uh, at least a combination of the two you know right. at least being able to produce on offense from a center fielder but clearly we don't have that this year um Ouch. i mean look man Brad, I know it's, it's the, bradley zimmer looks like he's window tough. shopping man at the plate yeah. like when it comes to oh two he's he literally doesn't swing it's tough it it's <laughs> it's tough right now it, it's it's so up and down and it's the injuries are you know it's kind of heartbreaking right now more so instead of being like frustrated with the team not performing to a level it's just becoming like heartbreaking for the team and and these guys that are trying to give everything they have to continue the culture that this team has put in place over the last few years to do that and they're putting their, their bodies on the line to the ultimate degree right now. Well, and it magnifies the issues that we've even had before, where, you know, coming into the year, it was, you know, you had Billy Hamilton, who was somebody who possibly could have played in the outfield. And look, do I think he could have been the savior out in center field? Absolutely not. But I think that he's a viable veteran. Right. And knowing Francona, I would have rather had him than Ben Gamble. But the problem is, is that, you know, all of a sudden it became, all right, who's it going to be between Bradley Zimmer and Oscar Mercado? And in the span of a week, it became neither of them. Yeah. And that was the biggest issue that I took. And all of a sudden, then you send Ben Gamble down, you send these other players down. And now all of a sudden it becomes now you've lost Josh Naylor. Uh, you're you lost Jordan Luplo already. Mm-hmm. And Bradley Zimmer is playing decent, like not great. Right. But I mean, viable playing defense. But again, when your catcher isn't giving you anything either, look, and, and I'm not saying that you have to have a, a catcher batting 300. Like, I know some fans think like, coming into the year, I remember getting – we got a caller because he was complaining about um, uh, Austin Hedges as the backup because he had, didn't have as great of a bat. Like, you're not getting that out of a catcher. You're not no. going to get that at it all. He means have always been defensive catcher over all offense. E- exactly, all exactly. All and, and so that's why I look at it as, you know, this is a team that it, these injuries are bad. But it, what it did is magnify the roster construction of this team and the issues that you had going into it to begin with. You were relying on Mercado. You were relying on Bradley Zimmer somehow figuring it out what he has in over the last five years yeah. and getting healthy. And all of a sudden now, you know, you're bringing up Bobby Bradley, who I, again, I would argue should be up here. But now all of a sudden you're relying on him to be your offensive production. And I I just look at this as this has magnified the issues with the Indians even more so. And I think that you just need to bring in outside talent. And I just don't know if they're going to do that. I don't know. It only time is going to tell. And but to be where they're at as we're approaching the All Star break is is a miracle in its in itself right now. <laughs> Fair I mean, point. That's that's kind of what you have to hang hang your hat on for right now with this team. But one thing that always gets you going with baseball games is when you get to go to one. That's always one of those favorite kind of summertime activities to go to is is getting out to the baseball games, whether the major leagues, minor leagues, something like that. Getting that hot dog and and whatever. You know, the nachos or whatever you want to uh, get there and just hanging out with people kind of talking and watching some baseball in front of you is always one of those activities I was kind of you know I was back home back in Piedmont Ohio back with the fiance this weekend and okay we went to their county fair so you know kind of getting out for things like that that couldn't happen last year mm-hmm. fairs festivals 
you know, getting the food, the rides, and, um, you know, kind of seeing the animals this weekend as well. We were kayaking today. So it got me thinking. You know, and I know we're running out of time here, and we kind of went over a little bit, but that's okay because we always do. Yeah. We'll make this quick. I'm on the show. You can blame that on me. Yeah. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, you know I will. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. I, I, see the un- I see the underside of this bus. It's okay. It's, I get it. I'm fine with it's that. All right. It's all right. It's, <laughs> yeah. it, it always happens. It's, it's oh, the, you're good. It's the nature of the show. So, <laughs> but just real quick, those top three summer activities that either you missed last year, you just... You've been able to do. You're looking forward to the rest of the summer. Um, I'll start off by saying you mentioned with the baseball games. I've been to a couple Indians games already. I'm planning on going to another one here in the next few weeks. And you know, I, I the crowd there overall, it's phenomenal. You know, I posted the video uh, from from the Indians game there too. The crowds were phenomenal. Everybody's into it, and you know, it's just a nice environment to be back in. Um, so I love the baseball games um i'll also say that uh you know for me going to the beaches you know whether it be you know edgewater or going up to mentor you know at least trying to catch you know going to going to making a beach day basically and mm-hmm. you know being able to take in the water everything like that and then the one or i guess i'll go with two sorry sorry i know you said three i'll go one more um but <laughs> but uh, i'll say this i i love fireworks uh, especially, you know, it, uh, it reminds me of, you know, growing up, I always would look forward to the 4th of July celebrations yep. and everything like that, which we're going to have coming up here soon. Um, I, I always will look forward to those. And then the other one that I will say uh, that's very underrated is the Cleveland Metro Parks and yes. being able to take in, you know, a nice like if, it, if for me, a perfect day is walking through the Metro Parks, uh, through the trails in the Metro Parks, like 70 degrees, mm. light breeze. Like it's perfect, man. Literally, I can't think of a better day connect with nature and just reflect and and reset right is that's that's a great point like i I love to go to the metro parks and just do that every time every now and again peter your top three uh summer activities so normally one of them is you know watching the indians games we don't get to go out to the games as much right um we'll go to the captain's game so i missed that last year because Mm -hmm. there was no season um but really, now with you know YouTube TV and I, I, don't, I don't I can't watch the Indians yeah. games. So, Same here. You know I listen to them sometimes on the iHeart app on my phone. Yep. Which hey, I'm really thankful that we can do that because yes. for so yes. long you know they would black them out. So you right. can right. do that. Um, so I you know I, I do miss that a little bit. Um, but the going the beach like we don't go to Headlands that much, but we have a uh, beach at the end of our street. And oh, the, what, what's and it was actually last year was great because you know at the beginning of the pandemic we went we would go down there for the sunsets mm-hmm. you know beautiful sunsets. Right now because of erosion, like I don't even know if you can find a place to park. There's only like maybe a dozen parking spaces. Mm-hmm. It's just a small beach at the end of the street. Yeah. Um, but they have like huge like earth moving equipment there, so <laughs> that kind of. You know, hopefully they'll get that fixed and we can go hang out there because it is kind of nice to yeah. spend time there. But um, like the fairs, like uh, yeah. St. John Vianney has like the festival every year. And mm-hmm. so last year, of course, they didn't have it. And, you know, it's, you know, it's a typical church festival. You know, you go, they got some games. They've got, they don't have any rides, but they've got things that the kids can do. They got live music. And it's just, it's nice to be able to go yes. and just, you know, it supports the church. It's, you know, so the community and, you know, overpay for some hamburgers and whatnot. Yeah. But it's, you know, but it's fun, you know, and it's, it's really part of like summer. And last year was just so yeah. weird because like all of those things that you don't really think about, you know, it's like, and now this year it's like, well, we can we can do that, but it's like, <laughs> do you, you know, we're all vaccinated, but it's like, do I want to be around big crowds? Right. Yeah. Am I really, you know, am I, the... am I ready? I kind of like not being around a lot of people. <laughs> right. But, yeah. You know, kind of got used to the social distancing and oh, yeah. everything. I, you you know. know, it's nice. It, and, it will be nice to get back to you know to quote unquote normal. Speaking to that actually too, that actually reminded me. I almost completely forgot about like the different cities' home days. Oh yeah, like yeah. the home day celebrations. I, I remember growing up, that was always like the mark mm. of like midway like through summer yep. is like going to like the different home days. Like for me, I would go to like the Independence ones or like the Broadview Heights yeah. area ones. So like for me, I always looked forward to those to like those celebrations and everything like that, and seeing all the friends, everything like that. It it it's the, like. 
like you said, it's like those little things that you don't necessarily think about mm-hmm. until you miss them. Right. And once they're gone, it's just like, man, I, I do miss that, man. I do yeah. miss having that around. Yeah, it's last year really put a lot of stuff in perspective. And yeah. It, again, if the question is right now for your, for everybody, like, do I want to go out in those big crowds even if I'm vaccinated? That's totally fine. And like, that's but that's showing the next step. People are getting out, and if you're asking that question and you know, thinking about it, the opportunity to go out is there. So that's the good part. Yeah. Yeah. Opportunity to go out and reconnect with people face to face, which is <laughs> instead of through Zoom or just over the phone. Like uh, th- those are nice, but there's nothing better than just the face to face interaction that you get with people. My top three, real quick. You mentioned it. Fireworks is right at the top. <laughs> I mean. I got to be, I always got to find like the best spot for them. Um, yes. You know, at the Harrison County Fair, they, uh, there was a park uh, just past where they were at, where they were doing their truck and tractor pools. Um, and Sally Buffalo Park that was doing like this uh, music night and whatever. And they had fireworks at the end. And man, they had a long show and a <laughs> good show, but they had a long show. Like we were able to kind of watch both at the same time. And it was like the perfect spot for that. Um, you know, other things that you love to do in the summer. I mean, did it today kayaking uh, especially on piedmont lake down there it's so peaceful never been it's it's so peaceful and relaxing you talked about the metro parks reconnecting yeah. and just getting out there to reset i mean it's the perfect spot to do that you know it's a small town and it's just you know there's not not a lot going on and that's perfect a lot of times for me honestly to not have a lot of a lot going on and just reconnect with family and stuff and just get on the lake and go kayaking kind of float around for a little bit and just enjoy being outside um, not being around a lot of people. <laughs> That's one way to do it. <laughs> yep. Um, and then last thing is, you know, at the end of the summer, it's the air show. Uh, I mean, Ooh, that's, that's one. it's one of my favorite, favorite things to go to. It, the bad part about it, of course, is that when you leave, you know, it's kind of the end of the technical end of summer. But it's one heck of a way to go out. Oh, yeah. and I'm looking for missed that last year. I hate that the Blue Angels didn't push their schedule back because they they go back and forth between them and the Thunderbirds. They're just staying on schedule. I think I believe the air show is happening. Everything I've seen, it is happening. So the Thunderbirds will be in town. Um, but looking forward to getting out to Burke Lake Front Airport and catching the air show this year. So those are. Uh, I just love I just love the the sound of the jets coming by. And, <laughs> man, I I used to try to go watch practices and stuff to figure out sometimes where the sneak attack was coming in from those <laughs> those tactical teams and everything. Now I just let it happen because I'm just like, let's get low, let's get fast, guys, let's go, <laughs> let's a get lo- loud. A long time ago, there was uh, they got in trouble for buzzing the buildings downtown. Yeah. I was working one of those buildings downtown that they were buzzing, and it was it shook the building. It, did, it was like, yeah. What? It's, <laughs> yeah, it's a little a little scary in that oh, kind yeah. of sense, but um, it, it's still it's still a great time and great family, great family affair. Well, that is going to wrap it up though for this edition. Mac Robinson, thank you so much for coming in, filling in for Paulus this week, and always appreciate you coming on the show, man. As always, thank you guys for having me. I, I love coming out. I love hopping on the show. You guys do a great job. And of course. Follow him on Twitter at MacRobinson95. Catch him on 92.3 The Fan here in Cleveland and on the Hurry Up podcast, talking Browns, talking NFL. He's got all the big-time guests coming on there as well. <laughs> we we can only hope to get to that level here on The Voice <laughs> easy, of Land, where Mac, where Mac has reached, of course. And a special thank you to our producer, Peter Tellup, always putting in the putting in the work behind that glass, proverbial glass back there, and making a sound and look as good as possible. For Mac Robinson and Peter Tubb, I am Kevin Arnold reminding all of you, don't let anyone ever tell you it's just a game. And we love you all, 3,000. We will see you in two weeks. Catch the best of show next week, but we'll see you in two weeks here on The Voice of Land on the Big Play Network.